So what do you think of when you hear the word home? What does home mean for you? Family. Family. Comfort. Security. Security. Love. Love. Malachi? Friends. Friends. Right, 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 right. There's an old expression that, that we might see on a, a Hallmark card, but I think it's true. Home is where the heart is, right? Home is where the heart is. Home can be a place, a physical place, but perhaps a broader, more fluid definition of home would be it's the space where we experience all of those things, the comfort, the love, the security, the family, the friends. I think you would agree with me that this year of any year in our lives, with Thanksgiving coming up this next week, that we are, we are very aware of what it means to be home. Many of us will be spending this holiday weekend with family members who we have not seen for almost two years. Two years because of the pandemic. And so there's so much expectation this year about what it will be like to, to be together again. Do we wear masks or not? How do, do, we, do we socially distance or not? It's just going to be wonderful to be home among the people who we love most in the world. I think that the Word of God has a very, very specific message to say to us today. A profoundly important message for us to listen to today as we prepare to once again gather with the people we love in that space or that place we call home. I want you to imagine for a moment the situation that the Israelites were in when Jeremiah was called by God to speak to them. Their home was in this place called Judah, the northern kingdom. And God was there with them. God had called them. God had, had helped them to multiply. God had invited them to allow God to be their one and only God. But life was hard for them because they were surrounded by other nations, surrounded by other peoples who had many, many gods and many different kinds of values than the Israelites did. And those people were very interested in taking over the land that the Israelites occupied, and especially that holy city of Jerusalem. When we meet Jeremiah speaking a word to the exiles today, we have already heard that the enemy has not only been at the gates, but has overrun the people of God. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment, just imagine that we are living in relative peace in our community, in our church, with our families and, and our neighborhoods, and suddenly, there is a group of people, well-armed people, an army of people, who suddenly come and surround us. Imagine those people as whatever your greatest and deepest fear is. And they're at our gates, and we've been watching them surround us, and Suddenly, in the middle of the night, they come into our space, they overtake our homes, they destroy this church, and they take away a good portion of our family. They haul them away to other places, to foreign places. We don't know where they are, and the rest of us are left behind. Do you get a sense of the horror that God's people were living through? And this had been going on for years. The Babylonian army had come in and overtaken Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, the very place where they believed God himself lived. And they had deported their leaders, the people who 
who grew the crops to feed the people, the people who could give them any sense of that there was life to be lived in this terrible situation. And the question that the people were were left to face was, well, many questions, but one of them was, what does home mean now? What does home mean now when everything we have loved and, and, and everything that has oriented us in this space and made us feel, feel secure and loved and a place to gather with family and friends has been utterly destroyed. Where is home then? And what about all those people who have been exiled to a foreign land, torn away from their families, torn away from their lives, forced to live under the control of these enemies. What does home mean for them? And it's into that space that Jeremiah speaks the word of God. Into the space of of incredible suffering. Suffering because of what's happening in the present and unbelievable uncertainty about what might happen in the future. And God calls Jeremiah to speak to the exiles. He has gone to to speak to the people who are far from home, the people who are wondering, what happened? And where is our God now? And Jeremiah speaks a word to them. Two main things in this reading that Jeremiah speaks. The first thing he does is he answers the question, what do we do now living in this foreign land? What do we do now? And this is the response that God gives him. God says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives for your children, have sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you in exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. What? What? What are you talking about, God? You want us to not only survive but thrive in this place where you have sent us into exile? Are you kidding? How do we do that? We would prefer to just hunker down in the spaces that we've been given to live in and wait for you to come and rescue us. Kind of the way maybe we have felt over the last 18 months. But that's not how God works in this world, is it? God invites us to not only survive, but thrive in whatever space, in whatever circumstances in which we find ourselves. Whether it's the very best time of our lives, or whether we are facing indescribable suffering and uncertainty. God is there and wants us to find ways to build a life and pray to God and depend on God's blessings to bless us wherever we find ourselves, whatever strange and foreign land we might now be calling home. I think one of the most extraordinary things in this passage that that God speaks to these people and to us is that they are to seek the welfare of the city that has captured them. This, this, this people who have essentially kidnapped them and, and sent them into exile, they are to pray for the welfare of that city. Because God says, because when that city, when those people do well, then you will do well. Does that sound like something that we would do? 
No. We feel much more like cursing those who hurt us, don't we? We feel much more like getting revenge on those who have wounded us, because after all, isn't that justice? No, not in the kingdom of God. Justice in the kingdom of God is all about love. It's all about forgiveness. And in order for us to be able to pray a blessing on people who have wounded us, we got to depend a whole lot on the strength of God to do that. Because God knows that when we seek what is good for others, even those who don't deserve it, even those who have sought to destroy us, that suddenly we're helping to create a different kind of world. We're helping to create a world that looks a lot more like the kingdom of God, where everyone has enough, where forgiveness reigns, where grace abounds, and where no one has to be afraid because we're all looking out every day for the welfare of each other. What kind of a world does that sound like, Lord of Life? Pretty good, huh? That's the world that God designed for us to live in. And God doesn't, God doesn't take any excuses when we say, but, but we're in a tough place in our lives, God. But things are not going the way we want them to, God. But we have no control over our lives now, God. There's a pandemic. And to, to us, crying out to God with all of our excuses, God says these very words. Multiply, multiply your grace, multiply your love. Seek the welfare of the world around you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despise you. And I will bless you abundantly. Pretty radical stuff. That's what scripture does. It changes us. It helps us to see the world in a different way than we ever have before. And it calls us to account. Are we truly living as children of God, filled with grace, forgiven, set free to freely love this world? Or are we not? The second part of the reading is this extraordinarily popular and well-known saying. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm. To give you a future with hope. Wow. God is speaking this word of hope to these people who have completely lacked hope for all the years that they have lived in exile. And God is speaking this word of hope to us today. But what is hope? What is hope? Is hope simply hope wishing that things will be better tomorrow than they are today? No, that's not hope, that's wishful thinking. Hope is, as we think about it, as we define it, as we live into it, is trusting and believing that God is at work in whatever situation we find ourselves, in ways that will set us free. Hear that last part. It's so important that God is at work in the mess of our lives in ways that will set us free. Now, it's easy for us to hang on to this verse from Jeremiah 29. But we can't quite get this verse unless we look at the verse right before it, where God tells the exiles that they will have 70 years of living in this foreign land, 70 years of exile 
Why? Because of their unfaithfulness. God has allowed them to be overtaken. God has allowed them to be removed from their homes to a foreign land like a parent allows a child to make a mistake, knowing that there will be consequences, and yet that parent is standing close to pick up the pieces to be that soft place for that child to land. And that is exactly what God does for us. God is here with us as we, maybe some of us, prepare to see family members we have not seen in a long time. God is here with us as some of us face devastating, devastating health diagnoses and wonder, what is my future going to look like and how much longer do I have to live? God is here with us when relationships that have been so dear to us start to fall away and break apart, and we can't imagine living without that relationship, without that person at the center of our lives. God is here in the midst of whatever is happening in your life. But he's here in a very particular way, a way that invites each of us to return to God, to pray, to to trust and believe that no matter what is happening, no matter how far away from home we feel, that God is right here with us, messing around in our stuff, rearranging our lives, and doing whatever it takes to set us free from whatever it is that has held us in bondage. And so we can read these words that were spoken by Jeremiah to God's people. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. And so the the question that we are left asking ourselves today and that I invite you to take with you when you leave this place today is where has God been actively engaged and at work in your life when you have faced times that have felt hopeless or uncertain? What might it take for, for you to to really trust and believe that God is at work in whatever is happening in your life today and tomorrow? And what might the content of your hope be? What might God be be creating out of the suffering or the pain or the uncertainty? What new thing might God be doing for you so that you can be blessed in new and amazing ways so that you can then be God's blessing to this world that God loved enough to die for. And so as we gather with family and friends this week in that place or that space we call home, whether it's sitting around a table together or FaceTiming or Zooming with family far away, let us do so with hope. Let us be bold and brave enough to name what has happened to us and around us for the last 18 months. And let us name how hard it has been, how far away from home we have felt. And then together, let us praise God for the many, many ways we have blessed, even in the midst of this difficult time. And let us look forward to the future with hope, trusting and believing that God is at work in our lives, in this world, in this church, in ways that will ultimately set us free. And that part of what freedom means is that God will one day call us home. Thanks be to God. Amen.